Praise the Lord. Church has said, Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for this day of worship, glorious day. We're asking, Lord, that you meet us at the point of every need in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that your word will make an impact in our life, in every life. And what you intend for the word will accomplish in every life. Speak to our hearts, Lord, and let our hearts respond to the word you have for us. In Jesus' name, we pray. And his church said a good amen. God bless you. Consider we're coming back again, talking about Jesus, the all-sufficient Jesus, sufficient for every need. Sufficient for every person, sufficient in every area of our lives. Now we come, we've been following the alphabet. By the way, the reason we follow the alphabet is because it says I'm Alpha and Omega. I'm the A. I'm the Z. I am the Alpha all through to the Omega. That's why we're looking at Jesus the A, the advocate, the B is the bridegroom, the C is the captain of our salvation, the D is the door into the kingdom of God, the E is the Emmanuel, the F is the friend of saints and seekers, the G is the good shepherd, and the H is the healer, and then is the heir of all things from God, so that it can make us heirs as well, joint Yes, with Christ, the eye is the interpreter of the scripture, and he is the intercessor for all saints. The judge is the judge, the righteous judge. K is the king, and L, the lover of your soul, of your soul, is the lamp, and he is the light, the light of the world. M is the mighty God. But love and might. Now we come to the N and the O and the P. We're talking today about Jesus, the name that obtains peace, purity, power, and paradise for you and for me. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 14. For he is our peace, who has made both one. He makes both the Jews and the Gentiles one. He makes all, all his people one. Because he said that they might all be one. And as we come to God through him, he is our peace. He makes both one. Those on this side, those on that side. He makes all of us one. And he has broken down the middle wall. A partition between us. There are people that are still erecting a new wall of partition between the men and the women. There are people that are still erecting the middle wall of partition between them and the rest of the assembly. But Christ, who is our peace, has broken down completely. The middle wall of partition between us. It tells us in verse 15, it says, having abolished, it's done away with, in his flesh, the enmity, the enmity between God and man, the enmity between man and man, the enmity between friends and foes, is brought everything down. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man. So, man. so making peace. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. Have been slain the enmity there by verse 17. And he came and he preached peace. He proclaimed peace. 
he provided peace to you which were far off and to them that are near. Verse 18 now assures us in verse 18 for that, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. We have access to God, we have access to his peace, we have access to all the provision that he has in heaven for you and for me, for they and for them, for everybody, everybody that comes to the Lord. He gives us peace. Look at Acts chapter 15. We're looking at verse 9. Acts chapter 15 verse 9 and put no difference between us and them. Between us Jews and the Gentiles, and between us apostles and the rest of the body, between the minister and the, and the members, he put no difference between us and them, purifying their souls, their hearts with faith. It grants us peace, it grants us purity. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 19, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us watch who believe according to the working of his mighty power. And then in verse 20 assures us, it says, which he wrought, which he did in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his right hand in the heavenly places it grants us power peace through christ purity through christ and power through christ and the spirit he says we're talking today this time on jesus the name that obtains our peace that obtains for us purity that obtains for us power and eventually with the peace and the purity and the power, he obtains for us paradise. We're looking at three things here. Number one, Jesus, the Nazarene, our Savior, Sanctifier, Strengthener. Number two, it Jesus, the Overcomer, making us overcome sin, self, and Satan. Number three, Jesus the prince of peace is seen suffering. We'll see him. Look at him going to the cross. And we'll see him suffering. And yet, he is the son coming sovereign. Now we we'll see him suffering. But now we'll see him. Later we'll see him as the one that will soon reign. The soon sovereign. We're looking at number one. Number one, Jesus the Nazarene. Our savior, our sanctifier, our strengthener. Jesus is referred to as the Nazarene. Look at um, Matthew chapter 2, reading from verse 23. You'll see the title it was given. It says, and he came and he dwelt in a city called Nazareth. Look at this. That it might be fulfilled. Which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. This Jesus, the Nazarene, is our Savior. This Jesus, the Nazarene, is our sanctifier. And is the one that strengthens us. In every area of our lives, spiritual and natural, so that we can be what he wants us to be, we can do what he wants us to do, and we can achieve everything he says before us that will achieve the Nazarene, a savior, the Nazarene, a sanctified the Nazarene, our strengthener. He tells us in Second Peter chapter 1 how that happens. He tells us what he infuses our lives with according as his divine power has given unto us all things. Praise the Lord. You have all things. In Christ 
I have all things. There's not nothing you're searching for and looking for and praying for that God will say, oh, that's not part of the deal. Everything is part of the provision. And he has given us, he says, all things. All things that pertain unto life. All things that pertain unto our spiritual life is giving us everything you need, everything I need, everything everybody needs so that we can accomplish, we can succeed, and we can have everything of life that will make us to have the victorious life we ought to have is giving us all things that pertain unto life and to godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, whereby are given unto us. And every time you see that, given unto us, you personalize it. It's giving, it's giving everything to us and to me. Say to me. Say it aloud to me. It said, whereby are given unto us, unto me, exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. Look at three things here. Number one, we're looking at the name above and be, be, be above all things below the sun and beyond the stars. Any name below the sun here on earth, that name is above every name. Any name beyond the stars, that name is above. All the names below the sun and beyond the sun. Number two, the name that saves that shields from sin. The name saves. And after saving us, it shields us from sin. Number three is the name that heals all sicknesses from self and from Satan. The sicknesses that come from self. The diseases that come from self and others come from Satan and the name of Christ delivers us, delivers me, delivers you from them all. Somebody give me a good amen. Number one is the name above all below the sun, the name above, all that is beyond the star. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 9, wherefore God, the Almighty, has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. He has given him a name which is above every name. Look at verse 10 there. In verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, at the mention of the name of Jesus, whether you are praying, you are preaching, at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven beyond the stars. Of things on earth below the sun and things under the earth. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. When you confess that Jesus is Lord, you are bringing glory Unto the Father. When you so live that Christ is above, and Christ is the controller, and Christ is the director of your life, you are bringing glory unto God. That every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord over all to the glory of 
the father it tells us in hebrews chapter 12 reading from verse 2 it says looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith if the author if the perfecter if the author is the consummation is the commencement of our faith and is the very climax and the, um, the the culmination of all our faith and we're looking up to him you need salvation you look unto jesus you need healing you look unto jesus you need power you look unto jesus you need satisfaction you look unto jesus you look you need abundant life and you need joy, fullness of joy on earth. Every day of your life, you'll not look to yourself. You'll not look to man. You'll not look in any direction. Look in. Of our faith, of the joy that was set before him. Endured the cross, despising the shame. And now he sat down. Above the sun is set down above the stars at the right hand of the throne of God. That's what Jesus is. He is above all. And anything that bothers you, anything that torments you, anything that tries to tear your life apart, remember our Savior, Sanctifier, Strainer is above them all. He has won the victory for you. And you'll have the victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at number two here. Number two here is the name that saves and shields from sin. We're looking at Matthew chapter 1. Reading from verse 21. It says, and she shall bring forth a son. A son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. By the way, that's not the statement from a preacher. That's not the statement from a pastor. That's a statement from the angel that God sent from heaven to talk to Joseph, the husband of Mary, the virgin. And the angel assured that she shall bring forth, Mary the virgin shall bring forth his son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? For what purpose? For what reason? What is he coming to do? For he shall save his people from their sins. And the one that saves us, the one that shields us from every form of sin. Because in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, this is the reason why it tells us, Neither is there salvation in any other, but there is none other name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now salvation is made available to everyone, everyone that will call on him, because he is the very author and the giver of this salvation. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 21, it, tell, it tells us here, it says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, anywhere, everywhere, you call on the name of the Lord. Salvation is yours in Jesus' name. How does that come? Look at verse 37. And it says in verse 37 that all those people that had they that had this, they that had the word that Peter had been preaching, they were preached in their heart. They were preached in their heart. They were convicted in their heart. They were convicted that all have sinned. They, they were convicted that nothing they did by themselves for themselves can save them. They were convicted and convinced that this Jesus is the only Savior. And now they wanted to know, what shall we do? How can we have this salvation? How can we have this reconciliation with God? They that had this, they were preached in their heart and said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, 
What shall we do now? The person they preach will say, you do nothing. Christ has done everything. But Peter just filled with the Holy Ghost and the spirit of truth in him. Look at what he said in verse 38. And he said in verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent. That's in your hand. That's what you do. You have to turn away from darkness before you can turn to the light. You have to turn away from Satan before you can turn unto God. You have to turn away from all the bad things in your life before you can turn to the goodness of God in the salvation of the Lord. Repent, change your mind, turn your mind, turn around, turn away from your past and now turn unto the Lord who died for you. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the authority of Jesus Christ and for the remission of your your sins for the forgiveness of your sin sin is not forgiven until sin is repented of I, i'm reminded of that little girl uh, that you know went to the kitchen and took uh, meat from the pot and was uh, chewing it and the mother just came suddenly and says my daughter what's that and the daughter said i'm sorry mommy and kept on chewing the meat. I'm sorry, mommy. And kept on enjoying the meat. I'm sorry, mommy. And kept on holding on to the meat. Now, when you hold on to your sin, I'm sorry has no meaning. When you delight in your sin, when you rejoice in your sin, I am sorry has no meaning. When you are holding on, and when you say, I think I want more of this, the sins of this world, and the sins you are used to, and you hold on to that, repentance has no meaning. It's when you turn. It's when you say, all those things I did in the past, I detest them. I hate them. I reject them. And I throw them away, spill them away from my life. That's when repentance has meaning. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, removal, forgiveness, cleansing of your sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 39. In verse 39, for the promise is unto you and to your children. The promise of salvation unto you and your children. The promise of the peace of God is unto you and to your children. And the promise of purity of heart, holiness of life, everywhere transparent to holiness. That promise is unto you. And the promise of the power of the Holy Ghost, the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And then in verse 40, in order to tell them, and with many other words, did he testify and exhort sin, save yourselves. Rescue yourselves from this unto what generation, verse 41, and they that gladly received is what? That's how you know those who are going to get saved. He talked about repentance and he gladly received the word. He said, ye crucified the Lord of life and the Lord of glory and they joyfully received the word. They said, yes, that's who we were. We were the person, the people responsible for the death of Christ, the Savior. And so when they gladly received the word, he said, turn, turn from this untoward generation. You have been part of the untoward generation. You have been evil. You have been carnal. You have been sinful. You have been evil. Now, take yourself out of this untoward generation. And they that gladly received that word 
were baptized and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls in verse 42. Verse 42, they didn't say, I just went there, I just raised up my hand, and now I am through. When the next crusade comes, I'll come back again. No, look at what they did, and they continued steadfastly. They continued in the Lord. They continued in his salvation. They continued in uh, their conversion. They continued in their connection with the Lord. They didn't say, I just raised up my hand. I just, you know, wrote down my name in the register. And now that is all. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the name that heals all sicknesses. It will heal you. It will heal you. All sicknesses from self. <laughs> I didn't hear that before somebody says. Sicknesses from self. Sicknesses that is caused by myself. You remember Nebuchadnezzar? He was walking and looking at the kingdom. And the sin of pride took hold of him. And he said, is this not Babylon, which are built for the glory of my name? And as the word came out of his mouth, it was turned to an animal. There are sicknesses that come. There are diseases that come because of self. Here comes Gehazi. Look, my master refuses to take anything from this Naaman, I'll run after him. And he ran after him and told the lie and got something. And so he came back and put everything neatly somewhere. And Elisha, the master, said, Gesai, where are you coming from? Thy servant went nowhere. Uh, didn't I see you as you ran after that person and you got that? Is this such a time? The leprosy of name and calm upon you. That man had the sickness from self. It was himself that caused that. Look at Herod. And Herod gave a great speech. And the people said, This is the voice of a God, not the voice of a man. And he accepted that. He was looking for honor from men. He was looking for congratulations from men. He was looking for, you know, the glory that men could give. He accepted that an angel came immediately and smote him and he died and he brought forth worms. There are sicknesses from cell. Abimelech, you are a dead man. Me, what have I done? That woman, what you, Sarah, is somebody else's wife. Didn't I do this in the innocence of my heart? Well, restore her. If you do not restore her, you will die. And already the disease came on him and on his family. Let him pray for you. And the Lord will heal you. And Abraham paid for him and the Lord healed him and healed the whole household. The point is this, the sicknesses that come from self. The people who smoke, the people who drink, the people who take hard drugs, the people who take marijuana, they bring the sicknesses upon themselves. But we have Jesus, the name that heals all sicknesses from self or from Satan. Jesus went about doing good and healing all that are oppressed of the devil. Of the devil, there are sicknesses that come from Satan. And when you come to Christ, when you come to the Lord, this name, the name of Jesus will take sickness away from you. I didn't hear a good amen. Look at Acts chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 6. 
Acts chapter 3, we're looking at verse 6. It says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. What happened? He rose up and he walked. And we are told the secret of that healing. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, it says, And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the name, the faith, which is by him, has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. It will give you perfect soundness, perfect health, perfect deliverance, as if you had never been sick, as if you have never been oppressed. Perfect healing, perfect health, perfect soundness, in the name of the Lord. We're coming to point number two here. Point number two, we're looking at Jesus, the overcomer, making us to overcome sin, self, and Satan. He is the overcomer. And because of his presence in our lives, he makes us overcome. Not only that his present is prominent in our lives. On our tongue, the name is always there. In our heart, the name is always there. In our very being, in our thoughts, the name is there. Because Christ is present in our heart. Christ is prominent in our heart. And Christ is preeminent in our lives. Because of his presence, because of his prominence, because of his preeminence in our lives, he overcame and we will overcome. You will overcome. We're looking at three things here. Number one, number one, we're looking at the only begotten son making us holy beloved sons. Number two, the offering of our secured salvation and steadfast sanctification. Number three, the overcomer in our stead for our sake. He overcame. He overcame on our behalf. And he overcame so that he would live in us and give us the power to be and overcome it. Look at number one. Number one is the only begotten son. Making us holy. And making us beloved sons. In John chapter 1. Reading from verse 12. We're told about Jesus Christ. And about what he did for us. We're told about Jesus Christ. And what he accomplishes in us. When we believe him, look at John chapter 1, reading from verse 12 there, but as many as received him, they don't just receive doctrine. There are people that receive doctrine in their head, but they have not received Jesus in their heart. They have not just, we have not just received the practice of believers. This is how believers talk. This is how they look. And this is how they walk. And this is how they dress. And then we copy that. We're not receiving patterns or practices. As many as received him. We're not receiving religion. We're not receiving my main tradition. We're coming to receive the one who died for us on the cross of Calvary. As many as received him, received him, Jesus. He says to them, give ye power, give ye the privilege to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. And they were told in First John chapter 3 
I'm reading there from verse 1. First John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called, look at this, the sons of God. While we are yet alive, not after we have died. While we are yet alive, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And from that moment of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, we are now called the sons of God, therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. What kind of sons? Believing sons of God. What kind of sons? They are the well-behaved sons of God. What kind of sons? They are the beloved sons. Beloved, now are we the sons of God? And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be, we shall be like him. You'll be like him. I said you'll be like him. <laughs> Pastor, I don't understand. I thought now that we are children of God, we're already like him. Yes, in character. Yes, in heart. Yes, in our spiritual life. But you know, when he rose from the dead and the disciples were inside and they locked the door, he didn't talk to us for the key. He just said, you know, go through the closed door. And he said, peace be unto you. We're not like him in that area now. We cannot just enter into those locked doors and say, peace be unto you. And you know, he told, uh, you know, Mary, he said, don't touch me yet. I go to the Father. Go tell my disciples that I am risen. And he went to heaven that same day. He came back. It will take a long time traveling from the earth to heaven, uh, you know, to the sun, and then from the sun to heaven. And one day it just went like that, and you know, he came back. We shall be like him. You will be like him. You'll not need your tricycle to go anywhere. You'll not need your vehicle to go anywhere. You'll not even need an aeroplane. The thoughts in your heart. And as the thought gets to your heart, you just get there. And that's how we're going to be moving about in the millennium. It says we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says... And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Thank God your time is coming. Look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at the offering for our secured salvation and steadfast sanctification. He offered himself. In Ephesians chapter 5, looking at verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2, and walk in love. Don't walk in hatred because you'll be far away from Christ. Don't walk in malice because you'll be far away from Christ. Don't walk in wickedness. You'll be far away from Christ. Don't walk in hypocrisy. Don't walk in pretense. How does the Christian walk? The saved soul. The sanctified souls. How do we walk? Walk in love as Christ also has loved us. And he has given himself for us an offering. An offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. And what does that do in your life, in my life, in the life of the believer, in the life of the church? Look at verse 25. In verse 25, husbands, love your wives. Don't hate your wives. Husbands, love your wives. Uh, don't grudge your wife. Husbands, love your wives. And do not uh, have any enmity because of what your mother said. When she came here the other time, and uh, she, take care of her. Am I not taking care of her? Okay, you'll see what I'll do now. Don't do that to your wife. Don't grudge your wife. Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He gave himself as an offering. Why? 
verse 26 that she might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word verse 27 so that he might present ye to himself a glorious church was a glorious church a church does, that does not have any of the members committing atrocities stealing from the government a church that does not have hidden sin hidden sin with the minister hidden sin with the members a church that is purged a church that is purified a church that god has taken away every sin that people were sweeping under the carpet the reason jesus gave himself as an offering is so that he will give us secure salvation and give us steadfast sanctification that he by presenting to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy. That the church should be holy. That the church will be holy. You know, sometimes I, you know, I'm invited to conferences and I would not be the only speaker there. I preach and others preach and I'm sitting down there listening to other invited ministers of the gospel. And I hear somebody preaching and he's saying, nobody can be holy here on earth. And in that one statement, he cancels Calvary. In that one statement, he puts on the feet and he tramples on the offering, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He says, as a preacher, he wants to tell the congregation, nobody can be holy. Not only that, then he will say that he himself preaching unto them, he has his own sin. That if he says he has no sin, he deceives himself. That man shall not be on the pulpit. He contradicts everything that Christ paid for on the cross of Calvary. Because he died. He gave his blood. He shed his blood so that he'll present the church glorious. Not having spot. Not having wrinkle, wrinkly, wrinkle is the sign of the old man still in somebody's life. So any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I believe. I believe that it make us all holy in Jesus' name. The ministers of the church, his church will be holy. The members of his church, of the body of Christ, will be holy in Jesus' name. Holy within and holy without. Holy in private, holy in the public. Holy when the members are watching. Holy when no member of the church is there. He carries the holiness of God with him and the members too. Those who have really been saved, those who are really sanctified, you'll be holy through and through in Jesus, in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three here is the overcomer in our state. Think about that. It, it doesn't really need to overcome anything. It's been an overcomer from all eternity, but he came to this world so that it can make of you, make of me, make of us overcomers. And he tells us in First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 13. First John chapter 2 verse 13. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, 
young men because ye have overcome the wicked one. I need an amen there. Ye have overcome the wicked one. It's referring to Satan. It's referring to Lucifer. It's referring to the cunning serpent, old serpent. Ye have overcome the wicked one. Uh, you know, sometimes, as you know, as a leader, as a pastor, we, con uh, we confront people and uh, we say, uh -uh, uh, brother so and so, sister so and so, we see calling them brother, sister, because we have not confirmed what really happened. Uh, I heard that you went and you offended a lady and raped her. And the man, the person will say, Pastor, be gentle with me. It was Satan. Satan committed adultery, committed fornication. It was Satan. He is not able to overcome the wicked one. Sister, I heard you were quarreling. I heard you even took that other person and you tore the clothes in the public fighting. What kind of anger is this that comes upon you? Pastor, is Satan, Satan, the wicked one, so you don't have the power to overcome. That's not a child of God. The children of God, the people who are born again, the people who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, they overcome the wicked one. It says, I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him. That is from the beginning. I write unto you young men, young ladies, and uh, young believers. Because ye have overcome the wicked one. I will overcome. Say it aloud. I will overcome. You'll overcome the flesh. My flesh is pushing me. You'll overcome. If you're a real believer. My mind is pushing me. You'll overcome if you're a real believer. What they are saying, what they are doing is, uh, you know, it's a great pressure on me. I didn't want to be angry before, but you know what they say. I know, how can somebody remain cool and quiet when they say this kind of thing before you? They're not even saying it behind you. They're saying it right here in your presence. And so they're pushing me to anger. No, nobody can push you if you have that overcomer who lives on the inside of us. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I've written unto you, young men, because ye are strong. I am strong. I am strong. If the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus, dwells in your heart, and you're, and you're weak, you're weakling, you cannot stand. Every wind that blows will blow you down. What kind of life is that? It lives in you and it says, ye are strong. And the word of God dwelleth, abideth in you. And ye have overcome the wicked one. Give me a good, good amen. We'll come to number three now. In number, in number three, we're looking at Jesus, the Prince of Peace. We'll see him suffering. He will soon be the sovereign reigning king. In Isaiah chapter 9, reading here from verse 6, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 
He is the priest. He is the prince. It tells us in verse 7. In verse 7. Of the increase of his kingdom. And his peace. There shall be no end. The peace of Christ. The peace of the prince. Will never stop in your life. Continual peace, unceasing peace, unstoppable peace in the heart and the life of the one who has come to receive, retain Christ as a savior upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and what justice is. From henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And somebody shout, Amen. Look at three things here. Number one, the Passover sacrificed for sinful souls and sincere saints. Number two. The purified, the purifier of selected servants for secret service. And number three, the prophet with the sole significant sentence for every soul. Look at number one. Number one, he, Jesus, the Passover, sacrificed. For sinful souls and for sincere saints. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're looking at verse 7. It says, Purge out therefore the old leaven. You see, sometimes I'm bothered, I'm concerned. For the people that say they come to Christ and they don't take out anything from their past life. They don't purge out anything from their dirty past life. I'm concerned about people that say, now I'm born again. And when you look at the life, the life is full of atrocities as the life was full before. But you know, when you understand that Jesus is a Passover lamb, it says you purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that he may be a new lamb, as he are unleavened, for even Christ, a Passover, is sacrificed for us. You look at your life, and all the leaven of uncleanness, all the leaven of unrighteousness, you identify them. That's what I used to drink. That's where I used to go. That's how I used to dress. That's how I used to fight. That's how I used to go to the house of the boyfriend, boy enemy, and the girlfriend, the girl enemy of the partners in sin. That's what I used to do. And when you come to Christ, you purge out all the leaven of the old life. Because you understand, Christ, a Passover lamb, is sacrificed for us. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, therefore, therefore, therefore. Because you say you believe in Christ. And because you profess that Christ has come to make a new creature. A new love out of you. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Not with the old leaven. Neither with the leaven of malice. A wickedness. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity. Hypocrisy is gone. Hypocrisy and sincerity cannot dwell in the same life at the same time. Pretense and purity cannot live in the same heart at the same time. 
when sincerity comes in, hypocrisy goes out. Pretense goes out. Drama. Dramatizing righteousness, but not habit in the heart. All that goes out. When you have the Savior and sincerity comes in, hypocrisy will flee. And then it says, and truth. Sincerity and truth. Christ is the truth personified. His word is truth proclaimed. His children, his people, his followers are the truth performed. The truth is performed now in their lives. He is a Passover. He sacrificed for sinful souls and for sincere sins. We're coming to number two here. Number two, we're looking at the purifier of selected servants for sacred service. Selected. What does that mean? He gives some apostles, not everybody, he selects those who are apostles. And some prophets, not everyone, he selects them. And some evangelists, he selects them. And some pastors and teachers, he selected them for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And those who are servants of the Lord, they become sacred, sacred, sacred. They see themselves as sacred. The people who carry on in life as say, oh, I'm just like you, you are just like me. Like Joshua telling Ahab, my people are like your people, and your people are like my people. They don't count themselves sacred, unique, chosen. To do the work of God. If he has selected you. That's, that sacredness is in your life. That you know you are a secret person. Selected person. Offering secret service unto the Lord. And what does he do? He purifies you. You look at Titus chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 14. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. Who gave himself for us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. All iniquity. All iniquity. I used to smoke, they say, two packets of cigarettes a day. But you know now, I'm born again now and I only smoke half of a packet. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. He is savior from all sin. From all iniquity. You know that. I was smoking much before, but I'm smoking just a little now. There's nothing like that. Uh, you know, with his wife, he used to have, uh, you know, three, four other women. is going to, to, to do whatever. And he always goes in the night. But you know, now I'm, I'm changed. I'm changed. With his wife, he has only one seen partner outside. That's not being born again. When you are born again, you are free. When you are born again, he redeems you from all iniquity. You know, in the office, I used to just go to the office. And when the, you know, the people come, I'm looking for my file. I'm searching for the file. When did you say you dropped the file? We dropped it at this time. I cannot see. And the fellow, the fellow who is asking for the file, he knows what they are looking for. They are looking for bribe. They are looking for money. And this fellow says, you know, if I became born again, you know, I used to do that for everybody, to the poor, to the rich, to everyone. And I try to get all I can get from them. But now, if I see they are poor, I know they cannot pay what I'm asking for. So I find their file. But if I see they are rich, if I see they can afford it, I hide that file until they give me something. My friend, you are not born again yet. When you are born again, when your life has changed, when you are transformed, he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. But that's not the end. He goes forward and to purify unto himself 
a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Peculiar people. That reminds me of Paul, who was Saul. When he was Saul, that man was zealous. Zealous to persecute. And zealous to do evil. Zealous to defend the useless tradition of his forefathers. But when he became born again, he was still zealous now because he was purified. Now he's zealous for God. Zealous to preach no more, to persecute. Zealous to teach everything the Lord had commanded. That's what it does for us. And if he has not done that in your life, you come to him today. He gave himself already that he might redeem you from all iniquity and to purify unto himself peculiar people, peculiar people. You know, those who don't understand Christianity, they say, well, I want to be a normal Christian. I don't want to stand out. I don't want to be peculiar. I don't want to be somebody they will look at and immediately say, that's a Christian. He doesn't want to be peculiar. And, and that is what Christ wants to do. He wants to make you a peculiar person, a peculiar purified brother, a peculiar sister. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to carry Christianity on my body, on my face. I want to look like the people, dress like the people, drink like the people. I want you to do whatever other people are doing. Then you are not peculiar. You are not fulfilling the goal, the call of Christ in your life. Anyone that comes to Christ, he wants to so purge you. He wants to so purify you. He wants to so transform you that anybody that sees you will know that's one of the peculiar people and they're zealous of good works. Give me a good amen. Number three here. Number three. He, Christ, is the prophet of the sole significant sentence for every soul. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 19. It says in verse 19, Repent ye therefore, repent ye therefore, and it says, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Do you see three things there? Number one, repentance. Number two, conversion. Number three, the blotting away of your sin. Number one, repentance. Repent ye therefore. Number two, and be converted, be changed, be transformed, that your sin may be blotted out. There are people who take the last part. He has blotted out my sin. Have you repented? Don't worry about that. He has blotted out my sin. Are you converted? Your life converted? Your behavior converted? Your character converted? I don't think about that. He has blotted out my sin. My friend, you understand? One, two, three. You cannot bring number three in isolation and put it as the only thing. Number one thing in your life Repent ye, therefore, turn around. Every evil thing you practice, every evil thing you've done, repent ye, therefore. And then he says, and be converted, except you be converted as a little child, you'll not get into the kingdom of God. The pride there, jettison that, throw that away, and let real conversion be obvious and visible in your life. And it says that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Then in verse 20, it tells us, and he shall send Jesus, which before was preached unto you. Verse 21, it says, whom? The heaven must receive until the times of 
restitution, restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouths of all his holy prophets. Holy prophets. Holy prophets. The people that God speaks through, they are the people who have been saved. They are the people who have been made holy by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. In our country, maybe in many countries, in many nations of Africa and the world, this one is a prophet and is taking women to the riverside and is bathing them. That one is not a holy prophet. This one is a prophet. And in the night, they're having night vigil and is messing up with the teenage girls there. That one is not, you know, a holy prophet. It's not a prophet sent by God. Those who are taking the money of the church and they're stealing, they're calling themselves prophets. No, the prophets are the people who are saved. They're the people who are sanctified. They're the people who are spirit-filled. And then out of the spirit-filled people who are saved and sanctified, he chooses some out of them, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. And the prophet is supposed to perfect the saints. If he himself is not perfected, how can he perfect other people? But you see, the Father God in heaven spoke by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, for Moses truly said unto, unto the fathers, the prophet, shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of all your brethren and of all your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things. Him, Christ, the one he has sent. Shall ye listen to, hearken to, in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Look at verse 23. In verse 23, and it shall come to pass, it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet, every Pharisee, every Sadducee, Every member of the Sanhedrin, every religious person, every traditional proclaimer, anyone that will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed, shall be destroyed from the assembly of the saints. It's a sinner remaining in the assembly of the saints. And it says, every soul without exception, every soul without partiality, every soul, everyone, everyone at that time, everyone at this time, everyone till the end of the world that shall not hear, that shall not listen, that shall not surrender to that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Now he tells us in verse 24, in verse 24, you and all ye and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after as many as are spoken have likewise foretold of these days. Verse 25, in verse 25, ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Look at verse 26. 
in verse 26, it says, Yea, unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him. Father, sent him. God, sent him. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, sent him. Sent his only begotten son. It says, to bless you in turning, in turning, in turning every one of you from his iniquities. The number one thing Christ has come to do, the foremost thing Christ has come to do, the greatest thing Christ has come to do is to turn every one of you, every one of us, from our iniquities. And now he gives him the final word, the final sentence, and the judgment of everyone on earth now is in his hand. He tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, reading there from verse 1, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God what sundry times and in diverse manners speak in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Verse 2. Now he has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed. His son, whom he has appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says who? Being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself Purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. Now, he's finished everything. He's done everything. He sacrificed for your sin. He has become your savior. He has become your substitute. He has become the one that gives you salvation, transformational salvation, a kind of salvation that transforms our lives, and then he also purifies us, he purges us, he sanctifies us, and he gives us the power, gives us the power to serve him acceptably and profitably. And now he comes to you, he says, you've heard what I did for you. It's now for you to bend the knee, to bow the heart, to turn away from every iniquity, and to turn to the Lord, and whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be healed, shall be sanctified, shall be purified, shall be made holy, and shall have the power of the Spirit in his life. You release yourself to the Lord today and you'll do something, something special, something spectacular, something significant in your Christian life. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. They that gladly received his word, they were the people that were saved. They that gladly received this word, they were the people that were sanctified. They that gladly received this word, they were the people that were baptized in mass, enveloped in the Holy Ghost and His power. Receive the word cheerfully, gladly, wholeheartedly, and come to the Lord and say, Lord, I've heard about the name. I've heard about your overcoming power. I've heard about the power, the peace, the purity, the power, and the paradise you've come to make ready for us. Now you surrender 
your life unto the Lord. And let him do in you what will make you peaceful believer, purified believer, peculiar believer. He'll answer your prayer as you call on him sincerely. 